Hello and welcome. It's Aki Anastasiu. Welcome to another edition of What's Next as we explore what the captains of industry are doing in this very challenging time. I mean, I know need to tell you that the world has been turned upside down by COVID-19, but this is where leaders are born. This is where organizations differentiate themselves from other organizations on how they act, how they do business, how they interact with their staff and their teams and their customers. Now, I've got a great privilege to welcome someone who I've admired for many, many years. Uh, I've known him for a long time. I met him when he was at Cisco. I don't know how long ago. He's been in the telecoms industry forever. He was recently at Dark Fiber Africa. He's still currently the CEO of Liquid Telecom, just for a few days, a few hours. And then he's about to embark on a brand new venture. And of course, he's had his finger in IoT as well along the way. So he's a fascinating guy. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Rashad Shah to What Next. Hello, Rashad. How are you? Hi, Aki. Good to see you and glad to be on your show. Oh, it's lovely to have you with us, man. How's COVID-19 been treating you? I mean, if I go back to, um, uh, let's go back to December, you were still the CEO of Liquid Telecom, well, you still are until you, you're going to be departing in the next few days. But I mean, you guys were flying, the b industry was flying, business was good around the globe. And then we heard about this COVID-19. And now since March, we are in this precarious situation and we are held together by the glue of telecommunications and communication oh. data. So tell me about your last few months and where you are right now. So Aki, what we were doing uh, most recently is, is really focusing very hard uh, as you, when we last spoke since December, is on closing out our financial year, which uh, closed at the end of February. So it was actually a uh, quite a challenging year, but it was also the first full financial year uh, after the turnaround process started at uh, Liquid Telecom in South Africa. And, uh, you know, recently those results were, were published and it's really a phenomenal set of results that were delivered. Yeah, I tell you what, I, I look at this turnaround strategy because I think it's uh, on the 1st of June 2018 is when you first started off as CEO, right, at Liquid Telecom. And in, in, in two years, you've turned this company around. What did you do? What do you attribute, attribute your success to this turnaround of Liquid Telecom in the two-year process? Well, I think the one uh, important aspect of it is there wasn't a single thing that needed to be done. There were hundreds of things that needed to be done. And very often, many of those things, tens of them, uh, to be done in parallel. But importantly, it had one critical aspect is um, keeping the customer in the center of that process and keeping the customer in the center of what we do, how we do it, how we were gonna deliver what we needed to deliver. And one of the things that, you know, as you know, in the telecom space and specifically in our space that customers want is a superb customer experience, but equally important, they want a good product to consume. So you would have uh, seen in the news uh, over the last uh, uh, while or so, we had to transform the network significantly. We replaced the entire active network and delivered a really, really modern architecture mm -hmm. and a service that uh, you know, we can really be proud of as a team and as, as Liquid Telecom being able to take what was Neotel and really transform that business into what it is today. Gee, it's, 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 quite a, it's quite a story, Rashad. And I mean, it, it is quite a story where the world finds itself because I shudder to think what would have happened if COVID-19 or a similar virus struck us 10 years ago, because ultimately it's been these networks that have really kept business going and kept it going together. Can you share with us any of the interesting stats that you've seen on Liquid Telecom's network, uh, the traffic patterns, for example, that you've seen in the last three months that have really uh, impressed you, that have surprised you perhaps? What are you seeing happening on your network? I think the one thing that we saw first and foremost was this rapid digitalization that took place. I think for, for us as a company, to a large extent, we were ready from a remote working perspective because you know we're a telecoms company. Uh, we prepare for being able to work anyway, anytime from anywhere. Um, and that's you know how our 
uh, employees in, engaged with our customer base or how employees engaged with the company, with its systems. So to, to some extent, and actually to a large extent, we were pretty ready to be able to switch to that mode of you know, being rapidly digital. And we had many of the tools already in place, which really, really helped. But what we saw from our customer base, now remember we're primarily servicing a business customer base. Yes, yes. And um, um, overnight, uh, those premises were closed. Overnight, many offices were vacated. Overnight, we saw retail stores pretty much shut down. And uh, those are our customers, uh, actually. So th- what, was, what was challenging there was, um, you know, you saw an actual rapid drop-off of uh, voice telephony. You saw a rapid drop-off of data usage, a rapid drop-off of internet usage from our enterprise customer base. But at the same time, we saw quite a significant increase from some of our other customers who sell services to consumers. So in the wholesale space, we have a lot of customers that consume voice services from us, they consume internet from us, and we saw quite a shift, upward shift of that uh, taking place quite rapidly. And, um, and so, so that was great to see. We also operate a significant cloud business uh, in South Africa and across the African continent for that matter. And yeah. there we saw a massive increase um, in the uptake of services on the cloud and specifically in Microsoft uh, uh, 365 product sets. So Microsoft oh, yeah. Teams, which is a, a critical product for video communication and being able to get teams to collaborate irrespective of where they are. Uh, there we saw quite a significant uplift of uh, services and not just in South Africa, but across multiple countries of our footprint. See, that's fascinating, Rashad. It's, it's interesting that you say that literally you had your traditional customers vacating where they were and their staff having to work remotely, but then you had other customers coming in utilizing other services, which is you know, it's interesting. It just goes to show you how agile your business is, that you're able to you know, bring in different customer blends with different needs and services. Um, I mean, the internet has certainly been put to a test in South Africa. And I mean, your, your, your history also goes back to dark fiber Africa. So fiber uh, in our network has been really critical in us seeing this through pretty seamlessly, I guess I would say. Um, when you look at the future and you look at five years from now, um, do you think that we need to change anything significantly? I know we've got 5G on the horizon. Do we need to invest more into the fiber networks? Do we have enough capacity coming into the country? Does the country need another undersea cable? Where do you see the growth of this industry happening over the next five years? I think, Aki, what became very clear to organizations, to governments, um, to society in general, is that the internet is a critical part of a functioning ecosystem. And whether it's the business ecosystem, whether it's an education ecosystem, whether it's your health ecosystem, it is a critical component of how um, you operate and what's needed to operate. Absolutely, over the next five years, there's going to be a lot more growth. But what, what you're seeing right now, that phenomenal shift in engagement, that phenomenal shift in consumption, the phenomenal shift in the way people and businesses are starting to operate and will continue to operate. Uh, I think that uh, you don't need to wait many, many years to see some of it normalizing as this being the new way of work. Uh, And that's an interesting one because you would have seen many global technology companies also shifting some of their workforces to be permanently based from home uh, for the future. And and that um, tells you Uh, immediately that they were able to get the level of productivity from their teams uh, irrespective of where they were based, whether they were at home or whether they were working from a remote office, Mm -hmm. uh, they were able to get that level of productivity. So productivity itself, um, you know, is being redefined. You know, having worked for a couple of multinationals, I I can tell you that very much many of them have always focused on, on, on the outcomes on the outputs that you're able to produce. So showing up to a physical office wasn't a compulsory activity. And uh, I think the globe has caught up on that now. 
uh, yeah. really speaking, where you physically don't have to be present in order to get these outcomes. But what also happened is the blurring of those lines of between work time and non-work time uh, really um, was quite a significant impact for, for many people. I know many of our uh, employees, many of our uh, leadership uh, team members have all had quite a challenge to balance that timing out. I mean, many of us would be on calls to late into the evening. And, and that blurring actually isn't great um, because you, you're sort of playing catch up, but it isn't great because it really takes away the balance that wasn't there in the first place, uh, yeah. as you know. So, so many of us in the tech space and in the telecom space wouldn't really have balance, right? Okay, we'll now and again get on a bike. Uh, and go, go, go for a ride, but you don't really have balance. But what this did was it really pushed that lever even further out of balance. Um, so that was, that was an interesting um, yeah. matter that arose in this process. That's so interesting. I mean, I, I, I recall back to April, and I just remember how many hours a day we were spending on video conference calls. You know, like there were like endless, uh, five, five a day, it was the, like ridiculous. And then kind of May started to balance out, June started to normalize again. At the beginning of April, can you recall how many hours a day you were spending on video calls? It would practically be the whole day, actually. Um, you know, we would, you know, calls will go from, from the morning to the evening. And, um, you know, a large chunk of them will be on video and others will just be, you know, voice calls. But yes. it was pretty much the whole day. So it was multiple hours per day uh, sitting behind the computer. And I, I think this is where the connectivity plays a critical role. And this is where, you know, fiber to the home has really um, been able to meet that demand. I mean, earlier on, you asked the question, what happened if this happened 10 years ago? I can tell you that many companies would have struggled 10 years ago to be able to operate a remote workforce without that high-speed connectivity, because you do need it to be able to operate. Uh, I mean, I, I personally have two separate fiber services coming into my home because wow. I, you know, I can't afford to have any level of downtime uh, at all. So, so it's, it's, really, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting to see, or to even contemplate what we, you have done without a high-speed service. That's so interesting. And you know, you, you, the more you talk about it, if, if this was 10 years ago globally, I think that uh, what, what fiber has and the connectivity that we have today has differentiated the world from going into a very, very deep recession and a deep recessions which we find ourselves in right now. I mean, I, I just shudder to think what would have happened if there was no level of this, no connectivity at the level we're experiencing right now. It's a, it's a very scary thought. But um, it's interesting you mention all of those things and the productivity and how people quickly adjusted. And every CEO you talk to will tell you that, you know, in the beginning of March, when we were told that we were all going to be working remotely and, and we were going to be shutting down for a while, it seemed impossible for most people. But within a week, or as soon as that transition happened, we all realized, hang on, it's not impossible, it's very possible. And how many organizations are asking themselves, what else is impossible within our organization? And what else can we do to make our, you know, our company a better place and more productive and add more efficiency and more agility to everything that we do? So you've had a very interesting journey. But... Uh, your next chapter is about to start, Rashad, and a company called Bright Gaze. Um, and from what I can read between the lines, there's artificial intelligence, there's doing things better, there's agility, there's all sorts of productivity things, all the stuff that you've been doing your whole life in one company. And you start there in October, but what can you tell us about your new role and where you're going? So, Aki, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, you observe as you on your own journey is uh, lots of inefficiencies. And so very often you're able to impact on those inefficiencies. And that's why, you know, you, know, you, you work in an, in an organization as a leader is to identify some of those challenges, make those adjustments that need to be made. And, and sometimes reimagine it completely and, you know, do it all over again, like, we did at Liquid Telecom when we replaced that entire network was we're not going to patch this thing up. We're just going to replace it because it requires that level of a refresh. 
But one of the other things that, um, you know, that's actually quite visible, especially now. Now, I, let me go back a second. Yeah. So this venture actually is something that um, uh, I, I would say has been conjuring up for at least five or six years in my mind. And uh, pieces of it have been coming together. Uh, I, I managed to do some of it uh, in the IoT space when I was still back at uh, Dark Fiber Africa and we launched this IoT business. Yes. And its objective was let's get this low speed connectivity out so that machines can communicate. But, it, you know, it sounded a bit odd when you're making this pitch uh, initially to your board where you actually want to say, well, yeah, we're the high speed guys. We roll out fiber networks, but I actually want to roll out the lowest possible speed network. I mean, lower speed than what uh, we all remember as modems back in the mid 90s, right? Yeah. From a speed perspective, but it has a purpose. Its purpose was let's connect stuff, whatever those objects are, in the lowest possible um, uh, price point and allows it to get to market as quickly as possible. And, and I think within a year, we had covered probably just around 80% of the population, if I remember correctly, with that network. But it was a step towards a situation where you have this completely digitally connected world, whatever those objects are, whether it is a a bin that needs to be collected and known, know whether it's empty or, or full, or it needs to be put onto the route of a, uh, you know, a, a truck that's driving around collecting the stuff all the way through to metering and informing you intelligently of your water consumption, uh, mm -hmm. even if there's a leak. So it was, you know, going down to a very basic level of uh, making stuff intelligent by connecting them. Right. So that was, you know, where part of the journey actually started to come to fruition. And um, that, that was at um, SquidNet, right? That was at SquidNet. That's, that's correct. That's at SquidNet. And um, so, so that was, you know, an important part of, of the journey of, of getting to where I am uh, today and in terms of what, you know, what is next. The second thing that, I mean, just COVID has highlighted as well is that, you know, digitalization of businesses and of not just how you interact with your customers, but actually what is your supply chain look like? How do you interact with your suppliers? How do you actually digitize your operations? How do you digitize your supply chain? How do you then adjust your operating model for this new digital world? And many businesses had to do some rapid fixes. And, you know, we, we saw a little bit of a, a bump in the road from our e-commerce uh, providers in South Africa, specifically the online shopping sites. Uh, but they, they managed to fix some of it, um, but they were, not in a, they were not used to having a complete digital operation, even though their primary channel to the customer was digital. The supply chain wasn't. Um, the supply chain of those individuals all the way back to uh, product manufacturers wasn't digitized. And that really was one of the things that, that caused these bumps in the road. But if you compare it to the likes of an Amazon, right? So if, we, if you wanted to engage with Amazon, and, and this is just the shopping site, uh, Amazon.com, mm -hmm. if you wanted to be a provider in that space, you must have already digitized how you're going to work with them. Otherwise, you will not be able to become a seller on Amazon.com. It's as simple as that. And, and that's because the operating model was digitized. It wasn't just the engagement with the customer that was digitized. Yes. So if you think about that new digital world, and it's not that new, actually. It's relatively old. But what's happened in this digital world is you've now got a combination of a huge amount of data that's being collected from every single digital interaction. That's creating, which in a slightly oldish term, a big data environment. But it's, you know, and I, I like the term because it really spoke to uh, the dumbness of it. It was just big data. It wasn't intelligent yeah. data. It wasn't analyzable. It was big data. So call it what that is. This new venture is going to focus largely on um, consuming and ingesting that data for its customers, whatever those customers might be, and helping to um, find trends, helping to find patterns, 
helping to find predictability out of that data in order to inform action and whatever that action might be for uh, that specific customer. But it's not going to be bright gaze alone that's going to be able to solve that. And, and I acknowledge that. While we will introduce product into the market, there are going to be loads of companies out there that are needing to solve this challenge for bigger corporations, loads of emerging startups, loads of companies that have already started up and are working in the space to actually solve complex issues. Those companies can't survive without a well orchestrated funding mechanism in place. Many small businesses, many entrepreneurs go out of business because they don't have the funds to operate. And that's why Brightgaze Fund One is being introduced. It's going to raise sufficient capital and use that capital to help grow these businesses and help keep them alive to solve the problems that they are there to solve. Because uh, I'm not going to be able to solve it with my new team um, in the AI space. We need 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 companies um, that can actually solve multiple challenges in the space. You, you may also recall when we launched the IoT network in South Africa, mm. one of the programs we ran there was an IoT entrepreneurship program. And that yeah. program was designed to get makers making products. It was designed to get the broader industry participating in IoT and producing products. And as of today, there are just under 50 products produced in South Africa that work on the Sigfox network. So it's about 47 to be exact. And the number of companies or entrepreneurs that went through the program and you know, was about 35 to 40 in that range. The, the current intake is... Uh, just over 20 of them. And, and some of them have produced product that now went to market. You know, it's not a big hit rate, but it's about 10% hit rate of yes. that. Yes. In terms of guys that have actually produced product that uh, now people are consuming. So, so when, you, when you think about, you know, engaging in a new ecosystem, um, we can't solve it ourselves. We need partners. We need competitors to challenge each other in order to solve these complex issues. And so that's what, you know, the uh, Bright Gaze is going to focus a lot. I love it. And I love your payoff line, by the way. You talk about ingesting data to produce intelligent outcomes, right? Um, and and it, it's interesting you say the observations you made during the lockdown period. Uh, yeah, you, you're quite right. You know, I was often in places and often had interactions on the, on the online platforms like e-commerce. And I thought, but why don't you know this about me or why don't you know about that so you can make things easier? Um, so you're going to bring a lot of agility and flexibility. Is it, is it a, um, a platform that uh, you've got your own IP or are you going to bring in other solutions to mold all of this together to get those kind of results you're talking about from the data? We're going to work with a couple of partners uh, okay. that we've already uh, determined who those early stage partners will be. But yes. we're going to have a great pipeline of new solutions coming from all of those businesses that we end up funding through Brightgaze Fund One uh, that will be producing solutions. So we'll yes. work with them uh, to take their product to market, to go solve these complex issues and, and we'll work in the telco space definitely because there are some nice challenges in the yes. telco space that need solving. And I think that's the other uh, beauty of it is, is having that insight of how uh, a business operates. What are their major challenges? How do they manage churn, uh, which is a great example. How do they manage predictability of how they engage their customer base? Uh, right. Those are uh, really, really nice challenges to go solve using machine learning, using deep learning, using artificial intelligence as a broad uh, catchment of uh, what we will use as a, as a framing. Well, I, I look forward to watching this unfold, you know, because whatever you've done, you've turned into gold. So I have no doubt that you're going to make a success of Bright Gaze going forward, Rashad. So thank you so much for your time. And my closing question to you is during the lockdown period, and by the sounds of it, you've had quite a few of these aha moments. But uh, have you had a specific aha moment during lockdown in the world of technology or 
could be whatever. What has been Rashad Shah's aha moment? You know, one of the things that I uh, used to spend a lot more time on is, um, is reading and some reflective writing as it relates to some of the observations that, that I make. Um, I think that part of it uh, got neglected uh, quite significantly in the last couple of years. Mm. Um, while time was relatively limited and you needed to, you know, get some exercise done at the same time because, you know, you're a lot more confined yes. uh, now. Um, you know, I managed to combine two of those things uh, pretty okay. So get on a bike and read a book at the same time. Uh, that, that was pretty useful. Uh, but uh, so, so there wasn't any major aha moments other than, you know, I think um, creating something out of um, uh, some of that knowledge that I've gained and working with some of the industry executives that I have worked with, um, you know, working closely with them in the future in a slightly different way. I think that's uh, something that I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, and it's, it's really been a, um, you know, phenomenal experience that, that now, you know, culminates uh, all of those technology shifts, all of that operating model shifts, all of the digitalization. I mean, one of the great things is we don't have to convince companies anymore about digitalization. We don't even have to talk about it. Um, they know it, they felt it, they experienced it. I think that was something that uh, I think was applicable for, um, for many, many businesses. I mean, the, the point you make of, of touching something in terms of gold, that wasn't, that wasn't a single activity uh, that I would do. I mean, I, I work very closely with my sure. executive team to be able to do that. And, and it was, you know, jointly delivering, delivering those uh, results. So, but uh, thank you for that. Well, listen, you've got the vision and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do with Bright Gaze uh, as you close your chapter with uh, Liquid Telecom and you embark on a new, new journey which starts in October. Uh, Rashad Shah, we will keep a very close eye and uh, I thank you for your time and I wish you well on your new journey and we will connect again. Thank you and best wishes to you and your family. Thank you, Aki. Take care. Goodbye.